Good afternoon. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, maybe nicer in here than outside. It's a little hot. Um, but uh, briefly, I would really like to thank my document committee, um, Dr. Ryerson and Dr. Madison and Dr. Spear, for advising me throughout this project and on my document. Um, also, I would like to thank Tracy Chimori for collaborating with me today on this music. And a sincere thanks goes out to all of my friends and mentors, um, and especially um, Carl, um, Mom, Dad, Kat, and Steve. Thank you for your many hours of advice, support, and listening. <laughs> okay, so why did I choose this project? Well, last spring I was taking a seminar on the French composer Hector Berlioz with Dr. Spear. Um, and one of the works we were introduced to was his first full surviving opera, Benvenuto Cellini. I vividly recall watching a staged version of this opera and being completely enthralled by the music while simultaneously being aghast that I was completely unaware of this opera's existence. Um, I began delving further into this work and fueled by its dynamism and wit, and eventually made many new discoveries along my journey towards today. Following Berlioz's own zealous determination to mount and campaign for his own works, I have undertaken to continue his crusade in the hopes of reviving his operatic music, especially that of this opera, which Berlioz himself described as containing a variety of ideas, an energy and exuberance, and a brilliance of color, such as I may never find again. The overarching goal of this research and presentation is to highlight the many merits of this opera, with a special focus placed on individual numbers and how they are useful in vocal pedagogy, as well as to address the numerous misconceptions surrounding Berlioz's vocal music, in an attempt to broaden the canon of solo vocal repertoire by integrating his works. Because of the lack of familiarity of this work, it is important to understand some brief background concepts about the subject matter, the composer, the era of French grand opera, and the history of this work. The real Benvenuto Cellini was a self-aggrandizing Italian Renaissance sculptor and goldsmith in the Mannerist era, he wrote an autobiography called La Vita, where he paints himself as a heroic artist, a fierce winner of duels to the death, a philanderer, and a morally compromised politician. Perhaps the most honest of his self-proclaimed accolades. <laughs> his most famous work is the sculpture seen here, Perseus with the Head of Medusa from 1545. And he is referenced in many other works, including musical pieces by Saint-Saëns, Gershwin and Weil, as well as The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, Moby Dick, Les Miserables, and other writings by Dumas, Balzac, and Hawthorne. He is the centerpiece for this opera, and it is the casting of this particular statue, which is the central focal point of the plot. Berlioz, relating to the artist as hero concept, portrays his Cellini in a much more respectable way. Um, he had a lifelong obsession with opera, but today he is more well known as an orchestral composer. Previous to this opera, he had already written, and unfortunately burned, two other operatic scores, Les Francs Juges and Estelle de Marin. In 1830, he won the coveted Prix de Rome prize and went to study in Italy, where he saw Cellini's sculptures and found his inspiration. Because the 1830s were financially difficult for him, he turned to opera in the hopes of gaining recognition and certainly some compensation. The Paris Opera, which he later uh, called a nest of adders and the enemy of music, <laughs> was the place where composers' reputations were measured. But the house was dictated by politics and money more than objective public opinion. Just briefly, grand opera was a phenomenon at its greatest height in the 1830s and 40s, with composers like Giacomo Meyerbeer and librettists like Eugene Scribe. These works called for large casts, orchestras, and choruses, elaborate sets and costumes, innovative staging and interwoven ballets, epic and heroic subjects, quick contrasts, and grotesque scenes. Uh, this opera, with the exception of a ballet, fulfills those expectations. Sorry, here's a little bit of barely. He looks like his flaming red hair. Um, such an interesting character. Um, okay, and Grand Opera. So this is a house that we still have standing today, the Palais Gonier. Um, and actually in 2018, this will finally see the work's first revival. I'll get to that shortly. So the history of the work until recent decades has been most unfortunate. 
Berlioz began composing the opera in 1836, but it had to be delayed for two years until shows by Aubert and Olivet were first performed. The rehearsal process was quite dreary, as the conductor, Francois Habeneck, struggled to understand Berlioz's progressive score, as did the musicians. Berlioz, the ever-dramatic personality, said, I am at the crisis point of my career and of my life. <laughs> the premiere on September 10, 1838, was unfortunately a failure, um, which Berlioz believed was due to the clackers and jealous critics in the audience, and he was right to a large degree. Berlioz was a fellow critic at the Journal des Debats and did not have a lot of friends and in fact many enemies among the musical culture in Paris at the time. The press furthered the tragic fate of this opera by renaming it as Malvenuto Cellini, and after three more performances for which Berlioz made score revisions, the lead tenor, Gilbert Dupré, for which there was no understudy, resigned from the role. And you can see here, here's a cartoon that was produced in the local um, papers and journals of Malvin Rochellini making fun of Berlioz. The opera was never again performed there for at least another 135 years. Many of Berlioz's contemporaries, however, were highly supportive of the work. Gaultier called it bold, original, and thoroughly novel, and Franz Liszt called it one of the most powerful works that he knew of. Because the opera was revived in Weimar, Weimar in 1851 by his friends Liszt and Hans von Bülow, there are now three surviving versions of the score that have been compiled by Berlioz scholar Hugh MacDonald, and he is also a musicologist in many other facets. He said this, Anything that Meyer Beer's Paris rejected offers a challenge to our musical taste and intellectual perceptiveness. And similarly, scholar David Cairns claimed, the score was its best defense. It simply needed hearing. Recently, the opera has seen a resurgence in its number of productions, such as those at the Teatro dell'Opera di Roma in 2011, the Salzburg Festival staging in 2007, and the Zurich production in 2002. They all received many positive reviews. The opera, as I mentioned, will finally see its first Parisian revival in 2018 at the Opera de Nazionale de Paris. The opera is undoubtedly a larger work. It is a grand opera. So in some cases, the lack of productions, especially by smaller companies, is for legitimate reasons. You have to have a large enough performance location. There's a large cost in the number of musicians that need to be hired for this as well. In my correspondence, many directors, however, cited a lack of familiarity with the work as the expectation and the low expectation of box office sales as the main deterrence to producing this opera. Interestingly, one artistic director said the following when I asked him why his house had never produced this work. He said, I'm afraid I don't know the piece all that well to speak of its musical deficiencies. It's Berlioz's first opera, not true. And as you can imagine, first efforts often have flaws that compositionally get worked out in later works. Um, it's also a fairly big piece that needs sizable forces, which often precludes it from being done by smaller companies. With this ideology, then, it is interesting that this same opera house has produced many first works, such as Mesfani's Cavalleria Rusticana and Beethoven's Fidelio, a variety of less familiar operas like Andrea Chaunier, Andriana de Couvre, and La Battaglia de Legnano, and many works of quite grand proportion, such as Faust, Manon, Boris Kudinov, Don Quixote, and Attila. This situation must be righted. And scholar uh, Gary Smidgall stated 36 years ago that Benvenuto Cellini is among the finest neglected masterpieces of the lyric stage. Cellini is one of the first operatic expressions of the rights of the individual as those against a society and contemporary morality. Because Verdi, Verdi's Aida is such a popular and grand opera that is still frequently performed today, I endeavored to con contact nearly 100 international and national opera houses to gather statistical information about the number of performances of both Aida and Benvenuto Cellini. The data amassed focused on production costs and revenues in order to address assumed financial stress when producing Berlioz's work. These are some modern stations. Here is the table that shows the findings from this. You can clearly see that Aida has seen much more success with 9,221 performances 
in comparison to Berlioz's 174, most of which have been from recent decades. I also collected data on the average production costs and average revenue from ticket sales for AIDA, which totaled respectively $858,544 and $652,906. It is hard to imagine that the production costs for Benvenuto Cellini would need to exceed the average amount for AIDA productions. As previously <coughs> mentioned, there are many misconceptions about Berlioz's vocal music, but the most affronting is that he has been labeled as being a bombastic composer, requiring larger, darker voices, which unnecessarily turns many eager students and singers away from, his, from exploring his music. This assumption of larger voices certainly pertains to his middle works, such as Le Damnation de Faust and Les Troyennes, but not Benvenuto Cellini or his last opera, Beatrice et Benedict. Lyric coloraturas like Pretty Yende, who will be singing in the 2018 production, and Patrizia Trophy are singing the lead female role of Teresa in this opera, as well as other lyrics voices such as Anna Netrebko. In a saving article review from after the Weimar production in 1851, in 1852 Hans von Bülow wrote, Some have tried to spread the lie in several journals that immense difficulties presented by Berlioz's work, particularly for the singers, threatened to ruin their voices completely. There is no truth in any of this, so long as there are operatic composers whose works have a higher dramatic purpose than merely titillating the ear, then the old and constantly renewed complaint is heard, though it is merely a poor disguise for the vanity of singers and the laziness of performers. <laughs> so, with this bombastic idea in mind, um, when tenor Gregory Kunda was approached to sing the lead role of Cellini for the 2002 Zurich production with Sir Elliot Gardner at the podium, he was very apprehensive to sing the role. He was a bel canto baritone er, tenor, and this is where he had made his success. He was very afraid of hurting his instrument by doing this, but he claimed after the whole process, after the per performing the role, in his rehearsal diaries, he stated, the most striking feature of the score is its wide variety of musical styles. Strophic and through composed pieces exist side by side. It is truly a melting pot of all the elements at Berlioz's compositional command. And here is where the bel canto voice can work most effectively. Berlioz provides the drama and the surrounding orchestration, allowing the singer to bring the human element to the vocal line. Throughout the rehearsal process, it became evident that Berlioz knew well the limits of the human voice and place the responsibility of the breadth of sound into the appropriate sections of the orchestra at all times. Perhaps Berlioz's Parisian public was unprepared for his iconoclastic approach to lyric drama, combining so many contrasting styles and sounds into a single work. The heart of the matter of this whole research and project is that the world of vocal pedagogy is married to a canon of arias which leaves little room for repertoire diversity or experimentation for voice students and creates an educational gap in their lack of exposure to this music. It can be extremely useful in vocal training and in recitals and scenes programs for a variety of reasons. First, as Kunda said, it is an incredible fusion of French, Italian, and Germanic styles. The Berlioz pieces serve as wonderful pedagogical tools by incorporating bel canto style melodies in a French setting with colorful harmonies, various musical forms, subdued Italianate ornamentation, precursory Germanic textual richness, and comedic historical drama. All of these can be found within a single aria. It's pretty amazing. This is due to Berlioz's study of the scores of Beethoven and Gluck while seeing operas by Meyerbeer and Rossini and Aubert, and also interacting with the Théâtre Italien. Nevertheless, his arias are not included in any of the standard repertoire books for the different vocal categories, such as soprano, mezzo, soprano, tenor, and bass. Here, this graphic shows the void of his music more clearly. It is the table of contents of the standard Kurt Adler tenor anthology, which does not include, which does include some bombastic music by contemporary composers of Berlioz, such as Meyerbeer, Verdi, and Wagner. Berlioz is certainly not the only composer to fall victim to a subjective editor's oversight or the relegated status of French grand opera as a whole, but this music is specifically worth resurrecting. 
It is vivacious in a way that is idiosyncratic to Berlioz and can be as infectious as his symphony fantastique. To demonstrate the quality of this music and the fusion of these styles, Tracy and I will shortly perform the first Teresa entrance aria, Après le mort une fois dans le cœur, after a brief description of the plot and scene. While I drink some water, will you please take a moment to read the first tableau of the Act 1 insert in your program? <laughs> fits in. This is Teresa's entrance aria where she finds a letter from Cellini telling her that he is arriving that evening. She is distressed about the encounter because she thinks her father might discover them, but she eventually gives in to love conquering all. She's a young teenager. <laughs> Thank you. 
exciting stuff, huh? <laughs> so, what objections can there be to programming that on a recital or using it as an audition aria? Similarly, Berlioz's scenes also conform to the standard expectations of the era, with the likes of two-part duets, three-part drinking songs, and comedic trios. He fills Benvenuto Cellini with beautifully crafted ensemble pieces that would be perfect ex excerpts on scenes programs. Also, many educational scenes uh, programs would offer, do operate without full orchestra and performance, so piano vocal versions are even more accessible to less mature voices. Certainly, I would like to make note, though, that this music, I believe, is for somewhat more advanced singers. Certainly, a uh, senior or even master students definitely could, should be accessing this, but um, it may not be quite appropriate for freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. Yeah. <laughs> it is a little bit complex, so in that sense. But I do believe that it's being put off for way, too, way too long and not being heard at all, and it's really wonderful stuff. So we should be experimenting with it more um, with the master's and doctoral level students. Scenes by Mozart are regular choices for these opera scenes programs. So, by comparing Berlioz's trio from this opera, Omon Moreur, to Mozart's trio, Susanna or Via Sortite, from his opera Le Nozze di Figaro, the idea of using these ensemble numbers in opera scenes programs becomes more justified. The Berlioz trio teaches the same staging concepts as those found in the Mozart trio, with characters hiding and eavesdropping and experiencing a sudden turn of events, as seen here.
some of the characters are robots and it's very advanced. Um, but, um, you can sort of see in that trio, um, you know, you have here Mosca hiding, and if you keep going later on, Cellini has to hide behind the door because well, when she comes back, Fiora Mosca ride, runs and hides in her bedroom. She doesn't know that he's there. And then when Cellini escapes because she distracts him, well, she goes and finds Fiora Mosca. And it's this big, crazy turn of events and very, very funny. Um, so it's a much longer trio than um, the Mozart trio, um, where we have things like that happening with Susanna hiding in the closet and changing places with Carabino. Um, but, uh, and if we had more time, it is about 15 minutes long, whereas the Mozart trio is maybe five or so. So being grand opera, it is a larger extension, but again, it's perfect for more advanced students that are ready for this kind of thing um, in opera scenes programs and master's programs if they've been doing Mozart scenes up until this point. It's a, just a little bit change of change of pace and flavor. Um, musically, these trios are both represented in triple meters. Um, they include beautiful lyric lines as well as recitative-like passages as you've heard when the characters are conversing. And similar melodic passages occur in some of the vocal lines as well. For instance, Teresa and the Countess each sing a short descending and then ascending scalar-like passage more than once in their respective trios as seen here in these figures. Note that they are in the same soprano tessitura, even beginning on the same pitch of F5. So here we have the, um, the Countess one circled in red. That's her descending and ascending melodic line. And we have a similar passage here with Teresa. And this kind of motive happens very frequently throughout the, different, throughout the two trios for these characters. So they have some musical similarities as well. Next, I conducted a pedagogical study with renowned voice professors across the country in an attempt to truly assess the state of Berlioz's operatic arias um, in, uh, sorry, in studio teaching. Overall, 23 of 80 pedagogues that I reached out to responded to the three questions that I had regarding this research. Specific to Benvenuto Cellini, many of these teachers admitted to a lack of familiarity with the work altogether. The first question posed to them was, how often do you assign a Berlioz aria? This could be taken from any of his operas, not just Benvenuto Cellini. I asked them to respond with rarely, never, sometimes, or frequently, and the resulting data is shown here. From <laughs> yeah, almost never. So from this small but prominent pool of pedagogues, 60.87% of them are never assigning operatic arias by Berlioz. That is an enormous testament to the need for broadening the scope of vocal repertoire and for arguing for the inclusion of this music in the standard vocal repertoire books. In this instance, it is certainly a domino effect. The arias are not accessible through the repertoire books, which in turn makes busy pedagogues less inclined to explore and become familiar with this repertoire. We all know how busy life gets. And this finally leads to students' educational experience lacking an introduction to this music. The second question asked the participants, um, it was more multifaceted and more specific. It asked teachers to answer whether or not they had assigned any of these of six specific arias that I um, analyzed shortly and will explain later in the theoretical analysis um, to any students throughout their pedagogical careers. The specific numeral, numerical data is shown here, and this data supports the assertion that this music is being disregarded in the realm of vocal pedagogy. So the individual arias that we will be looking at are Berlioz's Entre le Mort and Le Devoir, which is actually the replacement aria for the one I recently sang. Um, Meyer Beer's Parmi les Pleurs, Donatzetti's O Mio Fernando, Berlioz's Le Guare, Thema Soli Idula, Donatzetti's Spiritual Gentil, and Verdi's Celeste Aida. The first three being soprano or mezzo-soprano arias, and the last three being tenor arias. So as you can see from this data, again, uh, only one time were either of the Berlioz arias assigned compared to the others. So again, it is infrequent in vocal pedagogy, and I think it needs to be more frequent. To further investigate why this music is rarely performed, I turn to the theoretical and aesthetical analysis to see if Berlioz's music contains some deficiencies in comparison to other arias of his contemporaries that happen to be included in the standard anthologies, as we saw in the Kurt Adler table, table of contents. I completed this analysis on three tenor arias and the three soprano arias recently discussed. Um, this example here of the tenor arias details all three composers' use of melodic sequencing in the vocal line and harmonic mode mixture. As you can see here, in the three different excerpts, they are delineated in red. In the interest of time, however, um, I will be spending a little bit more time on the soprano arias um, but overall, here is a compilation of the results that I found between the tenor arias. So the different things that I looked at. The subject material, 
um, the tessitura, the symmetrical couplets, um, the length, uh, the different rhythmic figurations, the sequencing techniques, and then harmonic mode mixture. So as you can see, Berlioz is fulfilling every single one of these boxes equal to his contemporaries. It's exactly the same, fulfilling all of these techniques and um, things that we like to hear. So again, I ask why is it not being performed and not being taught? Okay. Um, okay, to hear some of these elements and for you to make your own personal aesthetic assessment, here's a short clip of the tenor aria, Le Guarite Masolito. Different areas. 
So again, besides uh, some changes a little bit in the length of the tessitura, Berlioz's aria, aria again meets all of these same requirements by Meyer Beer and his contemporaries um, and Donatetti in the French Grand Opera realm. So to briefly assess the aesthetical appeal of the arias, to determine whether or not maybe that factored into the lack of performance, which I doubted, seeing as you all also very much liked the tenor aria, um, the goal was to, uh, or I conducted a, an anonymous aesthetic survey. The goal was to assess whether or not Berlioz's pieces are really aesthetically less pleasing than their counterparts that are more commonly published and performed. The survey created collected data um, that is not scientifically founded and certainly has its limitations and flaws due to the subjective, subjective nature of the material and also due to the un anonymity of the survey participants. Further research with more detailed parameters is definitely needed, but in this brief study, the survey respondents were a combination of both musically trained and untrained persons in order to garner a broader scope of viewpoints as might be found in a modern audience. In the first two sections, the participants were asked to rank their order of aesthetic preference of specific arias relative to the soprano, three tenor and the three soprano ones that we looked at. Here, this figure so shows the results for the soprano arias, and you can see that Berlioz's aria was actually the favorite. Or maybe you can't see. I know it's a little. <laughs> but at the top on there, hopefully the vision will help, but also where the devoir is the favorite. So, rolling out aesthetics, rolling out theoretical issues. Again, um, why is this music not being uh, used? Since Berlioz's arias are not full of musical deficiencies with these drawbacks, I turned to vocal pedagogy. One reference I utilized was Wolfcraft Opera's audition resource for aria tracking over the last five years. The frequency of the arias used in auditions and these statistics here um, have been compiled. In comparison also to Rossini's Una Voce Bobo Fa from Il Barbieri di Sevilla, which I will get to momentarily and why that's important. Um, this latter aria though, Una Voce, is one of the most ingrained works in the standard repertoire and shares many parallels to both of the Berlioz soprano arias. This chart clearly depicts that most of these truly wonderful arias from French Grand Opera on the whole are being overlooked. Um, compared to the standard arias that are overwhelming and consuming the audition environment. So, for all of you singers, thinking about when you go out into the audition world, if you are the 45th person to sing Una Voce Poco Fa, uh, it becomes a little difficult for the judges um, maybe to uh, differentiate between that. So there is a different school of thought between doing the same repertoire so that you know judges know what to look for and what not to look for. And again, if I were the judge, I would definitely want to be hearing some different flavors and different uh, music from the wall. So I continued asking myself, why aren't these being taught in voice studios? Why aren't they more prevalent in performance settings? So I looked at Berlioz's two soprano arias more in-depth in comparison to Una Voce Poco Fa, and I, can, I discovered many similarities as seen here in this table and an even more uncanny resemblance of the ornamentation between the three different arias. According to this table, it would appear that Una Voce Poco Fa and Entre le Moir et le Devoir share the most similarities through form, use of cadenzas, and vocal range, if you're thinking about Rossini's higher version, and performance length. Additionally, both of these arias feature a cadenza at the closing of their cavatina sections before an orchestral interlude that changes meter and tempo and signals the start of the cavaletta sections. Both cabalettas make rather extensive use of repeated text and balanced antecedent consequent phrases with occasional elongated moments of rubato inserted to disrupt the steady symmetry. The ornaments, however, are diegetic to all three of the arias, as we can see here. So this first ornament is simply a descending scale that is embellished by repeating notes of the scale in a rhythmic pattern of a dotted 16th with a 13th, 32nd note. This figure occurs in triple meter sections of the arias, and if accompanied, it is a gener generally achieved through a steady chordal or arpeggiated fashion. So in all three arias here, we can see this dotted rhythmic figure that appears. As you heard, la yeah, and you will shortly hear, um, so the kind of thing, and sahara, right? As we have in the if you're familiar with that. So, the next ornament then is equally apparent in each piece. This figure is comprised of a series of ascending triplet groups, though they serve different, different harmonic purposes for Rossini and Berlioz. The triplets in Uno Voce Coco Fa lead to a resolution on the tonic chord, like this. La vincero, 
in comparison to the Berlioz arias, where the triplets lead to the seventh, the G natural in both cases, of a dominant seventh chord. You previously heard one in Acre de Mort and Foire, and in Entre le Mort, we have this. Uh, okay, I might have gone to talk. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, you'll hear it in a minute. Okay. Okay, so the third ornament consists of a series of uh, incomplete descending scales. It's apparent in each aria. In Rossini's composition, these scales are sequential and again leads to a resolution on the tonic. Berlioz's harmonies are more adventurous, however, including within the vocal line, and these scales lead to a dominant seventh in uh, Entre le Mort et le Devoir and a deceptive minor sixth in Acre le Mort et le Foi dans le Coeur. The last figuration is simply a standard turn. Sometimes a grace note is included to create further melodic interest through this ornament. The Rossini version is sequentially ascending to the dom dominant, but the Berlioz versions are not sequential and serve a more melodic rather than harmonic purpose. So we still see these ornaments, even though maybe they're a little bit, uh, they're used a little bit differently between the composers, but they are inherent in all three of the arias, all four of these different kinds of Italian ornamentation. So to hear some of this, Tracy and I will now perform Teresa's, the replacement aria for Teresa's entrance aria. So the same scene, Entre le Mort et le Devoir.
So, further research can certainly build upon this thesis. Perhaps a synthesized score of the three versions could be created to present this opera in its more, most accessible form. Other extensions of this research could include partner, partnering with a university opera program and evaluating the experience and success of incorporating this music in a concert setting. The same concept could be expanded to other lesser known arias and scenes from works in the French Grand Opera tradi tradition. Because of Berlioz's status within the orchestral world, his music is a perfect gateway for revisiting the music and spectacle of French Grand Opera, which could certainly see a resurgence in modern tastes. In conclusion, Berlioz's Benvenuto Cellini offers a wellspring of new, intelligent, and pedagogically useful music that should be integrated into the vocal canon. Scholar Julian Rushton, with whom I had the pleasure of working on this project with, called it the most interesting and musically the richest French grand opera between Guillantel and Les Troyennes. And it has been said that its failure was due to its music, which was too good for its performers and public. <laughs> this research has intended to highlight the opera's many musical and pedagogical merits, and having been proven as equally worthy in study of its counterparts through the series of analytical comparisons presented um, here, this value of Berlioz's operatic music is undisputable. Embodied in this genre, his musical inventiveness, insightful comedic and dramatic understanding, outpouring of melodic lyricism and penchant for bold and clever harmonies that never cease to entertain. Perhaps Hector Berlioz, the master of dramatic contrast and irony, may yet find his place among the operatic sentinels through his brilliant musical sculpture that is been through the Thank you. <laughs> Specific arias, but this mezzo one 
is reasonably late and might be considered. I just wondered if you thought about that. I absolutely have. Um, and I did a little bit of further research. Another aspect of the pedagogical survey was there is one set of anthologies, their French grand opera, they're the Roger Nichols um, anthologies, and they're the only ones that even include one aria from Benvenuto Cellini. Um, they do include some arias from Leitz Reinen and a few of his other works, but they're extremely expensive. And when I did do another aspect of the um, survey, most of the pedagogues didn't even own the book. Um, so again, there's that. But in terms of the publishers, I did think about putting together all these different parameters from these tables that I saw. It's meeting all these expectations. Right. So contacting Kurt Adler and all these other people at G. Shermer and you know Hal Leonard and stuff and say, hey, here's this stuff. Why don't you start integrating it and changing it up a little bit? So I do think that there is room for that um, to grow. You make a good argument that this opera and its arias are neglected. Are, is it uniquely neglected, or are there other operas by other contemporaries that are also equally neglected? Absolutely. Um, <laughs> absolutely. So in, in uh, essence, French Grand Opera as a whole has kind of been relegated um, to being out of the repertoire, and I think a lot of that is because when we learn audition arias, when you go out into the world, it's to prep you for operas that are being done more commonly. And when these operas are not being done as frequently, that's part of the problem too. So with the Cellini resurgence though, as I said, 174, most of these are from recent decades. So it's coming out of the board work, it's not being as, as neglected of an opera, but even his latest and his last opera, excuse me, Beatrice and Benedict is also frequently ignored. Um, we do see it a little bit more than Benvenuto Cellini, um, but again, the, the duet for the soprano and mezzo in that, the hero and Ursula duet, is way better even than the Lachman duet. And what we know is the Lachman duet, you know? Um, and again, we have other uh, popular arias that we do all the time that are a part of our standard repertoire, but we never do the opera. For instance, de plus jour, how often do we do the Charpentier opera? <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, so again, if, they, if the opera isn't actually being produced still, I think that these offer really great pedagogical tools. Um, for instance, my first year here, I went to 10 recitals, and all of them, all of the girls sang Una Voce Poco Um Well, that's a soprano or otherwise. So maybe we could change it up with a little different Cavatina Cavaletta and just kind of uh, broaden our scope of this stuff. And I just think that, especially his music is really fun. I hope you enjoyed it. I get really excited about it. Um, and so, you know, I just think that he gets overlooked for this bombastic thing because of the two middle works, and we don't look at his other output. Yes? Do you think there would have to be some, um, I, don't, I don't know about coaching, but telling audition judges about these works? Because I think there is a fear maybe that maybe audition judges don't know how to properly judge works that they haven't heard nearly as frequently. Like, yeah, perhaps. Um, I'm not really sure how we would go about telling them. I think the judges sort of change up, you know, per event. But I think the goal is to start integrating in, into the repertoire first, and then the more it's heard, the more familiar we are with it, the easier it is to judge, and the more well known it becomes. So it's all this kind of, um, you know, domino effect on the whole. Um, but I mean, I don't know that everyone's entirely unaware of this stuff, but they should be able to judge just on vocal technique. You know, you can still tell. Um, <laughs> if a singer is talented or not, or has the chops for a certain role or not. So um, without them knowing that, I don't think that's a good enough argument for this music to not be done. Yeah. And as you can see, the wolf trap stats, they're doing that on purpose to say, hey singers, look at all the stuff that you're doing all the time. It's the same. <laughs> um, so I know, I, I think that they're trying to do that. It's only from the last five years that they're building this resource. So I think there is a push you know, forward just in general to sort of broaden our scope. Anything else? Well, thank you so much. I love you all.